It was 1.53 a.m. on the 19th of January when Amy Kringbaum called 911 to report suspicious activity around her neighbor's house. It certainly wasn't an uncommon call for an operator to receive as Saturday night rolled into Sunday morning in a city the size of Modesto. But as Amy told the dispatcher she'd watched a woman load items from the house across the street into the back of her car, the call escalated to a possible burglary in progress, a crime that was a bit less typical, but unfortunately still rather routine. From the moment patrol officers responded to 523 Covina Avenue, investigators followed a trail of bizarre breadcrumbs which led them down a bit of a rabbit hole, far from the path of a typical break-in. The details surrounding the burglary stand out as strange on their own, but because the unusual collection of very personal items stolen that night belonged to Scott and Lacey Peterson, intriguing questions sprung up around a possible motive for the break-in leaving some to consider a connection to Lacey's disappearance as well. By the time police responded to the Peterson house on the night of the break-in, the young wife and expectant mother had been missing for 26 days. Living just across the street from Lacey, Amy had kept a close eye on their East Loloma neighborhood since Christmas Eve when she'd vanished, and she certainly wasn't alone. The whole neighborhood, and indeed the entire city of Modesto, had been hypervigilant about reporting suspicious activity and peculiar characters in an attempt to locate Lacey, as well as stave off a possible encounter with whoever had taken her. But just a few days before the break-in, pictures of Lacey's husband with another woman dissolved the threat of a random attacker on the loose in the city and shifted the focus back to Scott who'd already had several circumstances stacked against him when his affair with Amber Fry was exposed. This caused Amy and her neighbors to begin looking even harder at the Peterson house, and of course, at the movements of Scott, who now lived there alone, and had apparently been living a single man's lifestyle well before Lacey had been removed from the scene weeks before. Amy was well aware Scott wasn't home the night she called police to his house a detail that only fueled her suspicions about the woman trolling around the yard at two in the morning, talking to herself and loading things into her car. Scott had traveled to Los Angeles to promote the search for Lacey over that weekend, returning home on Sunday the 19th to find the house had been burglarized. Up until that point, Scott was the most peculiar character law enforcement had found to focus on since the investigation into his wife's disappearance began. But when he called to report the theft to a detective working to find Lacey, we're introduced to another odd duck who plays a strange part in the case. Her name was Kim McGregor, a neighbor who lived not far from the Peterson house, just a few blocks south on Encina Avenue. Kim was just one of the countless folks in the neighborhood who'd stepped up to help with the search for Lacey, but Kim went above and beyond merely hanging flyers to contribute, spending quite a bit of time volunteering at the command center in the Red Lion Hotel, which is where she met Sharon Rocha, Lacey's mother. Not long after they met, Sharon asked Kim to help care for Scott and Lacey's dog, Mackenzie. Kim McGregor agreed, and although it's not clear when the arrangement began or how often Kim frequented the house on Covina, it was often enough for Amy to easily recognize her and the white Honda she drove. When officers arrived on scene at the Peterson house on the 19th, it was clear Kim wasn't there to tend to the dog. As we said, Amy reported seeing her walking around outside, talking to herself on the lawn, before loading a large black bundle into her car. But she'd also told the officers she'd just seen Kim there earlier that day to take Mackenzie for a walk. But Amy knew there wasn't much reason for Kim to be there at all at 2 o'clock in the morning, certainly not on a night Scott was out of town. It's not clear if Detective Banks and his boss, Captain Czar, became involved in the case when Scott called to report the crime after returning from L.A., or when investigators became aware of Amy's call and her report to the responding officers. But either way, when Banks and Czar concluded their interview with Kim McGregor early on the 20th, they realized right away that things were going to get a little tricky with her story. We know Kim was a neighbor of the Petersons, and though she'd never met Scott, she had met Lacey on a couple of different occasions. The two women were both involved in the neighborhood watch, and Kim remembered seeing Lacey at a couple of the meetings held over the previous year. 
Tim didn't know where she lived exactly, but she knew Lacey shared her concerns that she and others had about the neighborhood park just north of where they lived. And the night Lacey vanished, Kim turned up in front of the Peterson house to help, along with a good portion of the rest of their neighbors. But as she became closer to the family through the search for Lacey, meeting Sharon and finally being introduced to Scott, she was eventually given a key to the house. This was after Sharon asked Kim to start looking after Mackenzie, Scott and Lacey's golden retriever. Now you're probably thinking, if she had the key, why break the glass to get in? But we'll soon discover that key or no key, Kim's adventure inside the house that night doesn't seem to be rooted in logic or have much of a solid plan behind it. She was not only sure to get caught, whether it be by police who mounted a camera on a pole across the street, or by the watchful eye of a neighbor who was already on edge, such as Amy Kringbaum. But the items Kim took from the house weren't exactly the first thing a successful thief might gravitate to during a break-in either. And she didn't seem to be too concerned about getting busted, spending quite a bit of time inside, and as we'll see, making herself more than comfortable while she was there. Goldilocks may come to mind as we go over some of the liberties Kim McGregor took once inside Scott and Lacey's home. And interestingly enough, the three bears from the original version of the fairy tale weren't a small family, but three single male bachelor bears. Though the bears ranged in size from small to large, they were all generous, kind, hospitable, and trustworthy. And originally, it was an old woman who played the role of Goldilocks, and she was a far cry from the lovely golden-haired girl portrayed in the modern version of the story. The old-time version of Goldilocks is described as an ugly, dirty vagrant with a foul mouth. After being disowned by her family and shaming them with her impudent behavior and bad manners, they sent her away to live in the forest, but believed she deserved a stint in the House of Corrections. Either version of the Goldilocks character depict her stealing anything aside from a bit of porridge, and as the story goes, the bears left a house unlocked after all. But Kim hadn't been so courteous breaking the French door glass with her coffee mug to get in. Once inside, she crossed some boundaries that would have put either version of Goldilocks to shame. She kicked things off by pouring herself a Jack and Coke from the Peterson's liquor cabinet, the first of several she would help herself to while there. Then Kim decided to have a chat with a friend, calling an unnamed individual from the landline in Lacey's kitchen before proceeding to go through all the cabinets and drawers. Afterwards, she moved on to the bedrooms, going through Lacey's dresser, her jewelry box, the nightstands, and the desk in the guest room before beginning to raid the closets. Pulling the clothes out that she'd intended to steal must have been hard work because at some point she headed for the master bedroom to rest, or at least to get in and lie down in Scott and Lacey's bed. We don't know if she slept or otherwise, but we do know she left a memento behind for Scott. Kim must have gotten a second wind after her nap, adding some pictures to her strange collection after going through the albums she found in the living room. It's not clear if Scott still had the Christmas tree up in the dining room by this point and that's where Kim opened the gifts that had been there, or if she found them after digging through the rest of the house. We do know he took the lights down off of the house on the 12th and opened his gifts from Lacey the same evening, presumably leaving only Lacey's gifts unopened. That is, until Kim broke in a week later and opened them for her. She was even courteous enough to clean up the wrapping paper after, though she said she was so drunk by then she didn't remember throwing the paper away. Kim was with it enough to find herself a large trash bag to carry her weird collection of pictures, jackets, and clothes from each closet, but somewhere along the line she stumbled across Lacey's wedding dress, trying it on before stuffing it in the bag along with the rest. But she wasn't quite prepared to leave without an extremely personal item of Scott's to add to her weird bag of trophies as well. Adding a couple of pair of his underwear to the bundle before Amy Kringbaum watched her load it into her car. But with two or maybe three charges already looming, she decided to lie to Detective Banks and Captain Czar during her interview the next day. Telling them the French door was ajar when she'd been there to walk Mackenzie that afternoon and that she never went in the house or came back later that night at all. Knowing not much of her story rang true, Detective Banks met with fellow detective Al Brocchini to do a more thorough interview with her together at the police station. 
Before they began, they took Kim's picture and her fingerprints, warning that if she lied to them again, she'd be arrested. After being threatened with jail time, Kim caved and told the detectives the same story we just told you, or at least part of it. She told Burkini she'd gotten drunk there and did a bunch of weird stuff in the house, but that after going through everything inside, she'd only taken a bundle of clothes with her and that she'd thrown those in a dumpster not far from the house. Brokini had Kim show him where she'd tossed the clothes out, and when they found them in the dumpster behind 601 Bowen Avenue, in the area she said they would be, Brokini assumed he'd finally gotten the full truth out of Kim McGregor, although Scott suspected there were photos missing from the house that she never admitted to stealing. The clothes were recovered and eventually returned to Scott, but Lacey's wedding dress wasn't among them. His mother Jackie later said the dress was eventually returned to him and he was able to have it cleaned and reboxed for storage after the ordeal. A few days after she led them to the dumpster, detectives were ready to call the burglary solved and let Kim off the hook, telling her they'd left the decision to press charges in Scott's hands. After asking for Brokini's opinion about Kim McGregor, he told Scott that while Kim was clearly infatuated with him, Overall, she seemed to be pretty harmless. When Brokini told him Kim was sweet on him, Scott responded with a sarcastic, that's great, but he was seriously more than ready to put the break in behind him. He wasn't inclined to press charges, telling Brokini he just didn't want to deal with it, but Kim may have weirded him out enough to make him move. Over the past few weeks, he'd tolerated the mobs of press, hostile visits from the public, the occasional DJ harassing him over a bullhorn from the curb, and living under constant police surveillance. But Kim's freaky visit seemed to be the last straw. Scott headed to his sister Anne's place out near Berkeley the day after she broke in, not comforted much after learning Kim was bipolar and off her medication when she'd broken in. That may be because Scott not only suspected she'd stolen pictures from the house she never admitted to taking, but he also knew she'd left her cut off sweat shorts on his bed, though Kim never fessed up to doing that either. Like we said, Scott may have been a little weirded out, but he didn't pursue charges. But it wasn't long before Detective Brokini took Kim's fate back into his own hands after an interesting call came into the police department from Eddie Gibson. Eddie Gibson was also known as Fast Eddie, an owner of a local restaurant by the same name. After hearing what Fast Eddie found on his property at 1228 Tully Street on the 22nd of January, Brokini found himself threatening to arrest Kim McGregor on the spot if she lied to him one more time about what she'd taken from the Petersons' house. Fast Eddie thought he'd gotten a quick deal when he found the video camera inside a barrel of old grease behind his restaurant, aptly named Fast Eddie's. The camera was a newer and more expensive model than the one Eddie had at home, so he fished it out and cleaned it up, excited to see it power on, and even happier to see it begin to play back the tape inside. But even on the tiny screen, he recognized Scott and Lacey Peterson the instant they appeared on the tape, immediately calling the police station directly after. We'll talk more about the camera and the footage found on it in a moment, but for now, Brokini wasn't pleased to find Kim lying to him again, knowing she'd been the one to dump that camera. But it seems he still wasn't prepared to charge her with a crime, not for any part of the break-in, nor for lying to detectives at every turn since. Which is a bit surprising considering how closely it touched Lacey's investigation, and knowing Brokini had been certain for weeks that her case was a homicide. Kim continued to give Brokini mixed up dates and times for her alibi on the 23rd and 24th of December as well, initially telling him she couldn't remember and then changing things around several times after others corrected her inaccurate timeline. But the detective was ultimately satisfied with Kim's final alibi for the 24th after hearing from her mother and a guy named Robert Watros. Kim told Detective Brokini Robert was her friend, but she didn't have his phone number, so she would have to drive to Robert's house to have him call the detective later that day. Kim's so-called friend did call the detective back, but he had a less than typical story to tell about where Kim was on the night of the 23rd, as well as part of the morning of the 24th. 
Robert said he met Kim for the first time when she sat down next to him at a downtown bar called Dew's. At some point when they drank together that night, Robert offered Kim his jacket when she got cold. She was still wearing it when they closed the bar together and got in her car to leave at 2 in the morning. But when Robert ran back inside thinking he'd left his keys behind, Kim was gone by the time he came back out the door. He spoke to her again the next morning at 10 a.m., which was Christmas Eve, hoping to get his jacket back, and Kim drove it over after doing some shopping, though the exact time was never recorded. It's not clear whether Robert called Kim or Kim called Robert the morning of Christmas Eve, but interestingly, this does seem to imply that at one point Kim did have Robert's phone number, though we all know how quickly that might change. Sometimes in the blink of an eye as you're pulling out of the parking lot of a bar downtown, still wearing some guy's jacket. Brocchini didn't do a whole lot to verify the information Robert gave him. In fact, he never really vetted much about Robert himself. He never met with him in person and only conducted one brief interview with him over the phone. In fact, he'd never really confirmed that the man he'd spoken to was actually named Robert Watros, or that he'd randomly met Kim at a bar on the night of the 23rd. Brocchini didn't question the timing or the validity of Kim's alibi through Robert early on the 24th either. He took them both at their word that Robert was on the phone with Kim just after Scott left the house around 10 o'clock that morning and that he'd seen Kim in person for the last time ever, right around the same time a neighbor found Lacey's loyal dog Mackenzie in the street with his leash on. Robert also made sure to note that Kim would be shopping between the time he called her at 10 o'clock and whatever time she came to his house to return the jacket, filling the precise time frames Burkini'd asked her to, and fitting like a puzzle piece with Scott leaving the house and Karen Service finding the dog and all to do about a convoluted story about the return of a jacket to a man she'd just met and left stranded at the bar the night before. It's a weird story that sounds like it needs a bit of vetting, especially from Kim, who'd already proven herself to be an unreliable source. Kim's mother provided a loose alibi for part of the 24th as well, telling Rokini that Kim was home celebrating Christmas on Christmas Eve, which was traditional for their family. But again, there were no times given and no confirmation from others to verify, just her mom's word that Kim was with them at some point the day Lacey vanished. And believe it or not, there's still quite a bit more to discuss about Kim McGregor. At one point, Kim pointed to her ex-boyfriend Matthew Lelogi for an alibi on the 24th as well. But when Matthew confirmed that he'd actually seen Kim on the 23rd and that they'd gone to dinner together parting ways around 9 p.m., the story changed to a night out with Robert Watros at a bar downtown. But even more interesting than their dinner date is the fact that Matthew is Hawaiian, and so are his two roommates, matching fairly well with the description of the three men Diane Jackson said she saw outside the Medina house on the 24th. Three dark-skinned males, but not African-American, standing outside of a van she didn't recognize. Unfortunately, Brocchini never dug into the vehicles Matthew and his roommates had access to, leaving a questionable area for Scott's defense to exploit during his trial later. It's a stretch to think that Matthew and his friends could have been involved, but it'd be best if Brocchini had done the work to rule them out definitively, leaving no question about what's reasonable concerning a possible suspect. While there's no question that Kim and the characters she brought into the case should have had their statements or at least their identities verified to lend credibility to her alibi, Brocchini did eventually have her take a polygraph test, though the Modesto Police Department have never shared the results. Polygraph or no, after another threat of incarceration from Brocchini after recovering the video camera from Fast Eddie's, Kim had another confession to make. Brocchini had confronted her over the phone, telling her, quote, I want to know what else you stole. I'm going to arrest you immediately if you don't tell me everything. End quote. After a long silence, Kim finally said, Okay, I took one other thing, admitting that she had Lacey's social security card in her back pocket as they spoke. Brocchini had Kim drop the card off at police headquarters, and because no more obvious clues exposing Kim as a liar came up afterward, he never had to make good on his threat, 
and Kim was never charged, though he may have found she lied about a few things if he'd dug a little deeper. The black cut-off sweat shorts found on Scott's bed were collected and sent to the Department of Justice, but they were never tested for anything. Short of finding Lacey's blood on them, we're not sure what they would have to offer for Scott's defense, but they very well may have caught Kim up in another lie. Investigators never took hair samples from Kim either, leaving them unable to compare those found on the shorts, which were never examined anyway. But that seems a little strange considering they took hair samples from Amber Fry and from the dog Mackenzie at certain points throughout the investigation. And it turns out Kim may have returned to the house after the burglary that night as well. About an hour and a half after Amy called the police about a woman walking around in the neighbor's yard talking to herself, another car pulled into the Petersons' driveway. But this time, instead of just one woman who didn't belong there, Amy saw three, prompting her to make another call to 911 again around 3.30. But none of the three women ever went inside of the house. They were gone by the time officers responded to the scene, and Kim has always denied being one of them. But as we'll discover, Kim tends to get a bit mixed up about the places she'd been and when she'd been there. Kim worked in a pediatric doctor's office in Oakdale, and she had a 12-year-old daughter. In fact, it was her daughter that helped Kim get her work schedule straight for the 23rd of December. Initially, Kim said she'd worked that day, but then said she hadn't, and it wasn't until after calling her daughter during the interview with Brokini that Kim realized she was mixing up Thanksgiving with Christmas. It turns out that Kim hadn't worked that day, but coincidentally, she had been to American Body Works in Modesto on the 23rd, the same company Scott's girlfriend, Amber Fry, worked for in Fresno. Kim was only there to buy a gift card, and she never had any connection to Amber, making it just another interesting happenstance in Lacey's case. But here's another. Kim McGregor actually called police to report suspicious activity around the Peterson house multiple times herself. She'd noticed a man and a woman parked in a blue pickup truck outside of the house more than once, and thought the couple might have been watching the house. And though it's unclear if she'd seen the truck before or after Lacey disappeared, we do know that Scott and Sharon discussed Kim's tip over the phone on the 11th, theorizing that the couple may have been watching Lacey, making plans for a fetal abduction. So it seems Kim McGregor was in the peripheral of this case long before Lacey disappeared, first as an anxious resident who, along with Lacey, attended neighborhood watch meetings, to discuss the safety issues surrounding East La Loma Park. Then later, as an even more concerned member of the search party for Lacey after she vanished, working at the Volunteer Center and sharing the tips she called into police with Sharon while there, eventually becoming familiar enough with the family to begin caring for Lacey's beloved dog, Mackenzie. Kim certainly overstepped more than a few boundaries when she broke into her house and opened her Christmas presents but can we really think of her as a viable suspect in Lacey's disappearance? While it would be nice to trust in a more concrete alibi for Kim and to learn more about Robert, Matthew, and his roommates, removing some of the means and opportunity that Kim would have to have to be involved, we can look at the motive in a couple of different ways. We know from Brokini and from the fact that Kim stole his undershorts that she was infatuated with Scott and certainly drawn to Lacey as well but Kim was also bipolar. Her condition is certainly no excuse for the burglary and it does nothing to explain the consistent lies she told after, but Kim's hiatus from her bipolar medication may have blended with her ongoing crush on Scott and her obsession with Lacey, giving us all the motive we really need for her impulsive behavior, keeping in mind that Kim had mixed in a fair amount of alcohol that night as well. Risky behavior with a high chance of harmful consequences is at the top of the list of symptoms for bipolar disorder. And considering how quickly Kim was caught committing this super sloppy break-in, it's hard to believe she pulled off an abduction or a homicide without leaving a trace of evidence. Hanging out right under the nose of detectives and the victim's family without slipping up somewhere throughout the entire span of the investigation. Although, we do know perpetrators like to interject themselves into cases often, and we haven't gotten to the footage Kim may have captured on Scott and Lacey's video camera, 
before she ditched it in the grease vat behind Fast Eddie's. When Eddie turned the camera over to police, Kim finally admitted to stealing it, but not until Brokini threatened to lock her up. She'd handed over Lacey's social security card the same day, but when asked if she'd used the camera or watched the footage on the tape, Kim said she didn't know how to use it and that she didn't even know there was a tape inside. But there's footage on that tape of what appears to be a bedroom in an unknown house timestamped at 4.23 p.m. on the 19th, about 14 hours after Kim took the camera from the house. The timestamp has been explained away as simply inaccurate by some, knowing it can easily be changed manually in the settings of the camera, but there are some clues in the stills and some corroborating evidence that we can use to decide for ourselves. The first three stills show the position of the sun. The timestamps on them say 824 and 825 a.m. on the 27th of July. Now you can look at these pictures and determine for yourself if that's the position that the sun would be in the sky roughly 2 hours and 20 minutes after sunrise, which was at 6.04 a.m. that morning. Another clip on the tape captures Lacey's sister Amy Rocha giving Scott's father Lee a haircut. The timestamp on that recording was January 10th, during the time the families were still friendly with each other, and thus far, the date on that video hasn't been deemed to be inaccurate by either the Petersons or the Rochas, lending a bit of credibility to the clip shot in the mysterious house after the theft of the camera. This is the still released from the mysterious portion of the footage captured on Scott and Lacey's video camera that was stolen from their house at 2 in the morning on the 19th of January. We'll include some close-ups of the initial shot as well, as many feel that there are several eerie and possibly incriminating elements in the picture if you look closely. Share what you see, if anything, in the comments and let us know your thoughts on the timestamp, the strange room captured on the tape, and how likely you think it is that Kim McGregor could have been involved in the disappearance of Lacey Peterson. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, give it a like before you go and subscribe to the channel if you want to hear more stories like this one. Until next time, stay safe, be kind, and memento mori.